Good morning. Welcome. It's good to have you here. Come and hopefully make your way in and grab a seat. That's fine. Um, take your time. We're not in a hurry. Uh, it's good to have you all here this morning and anyone who's joining us online as well. Um, it's fantastic that we can come together and all worship God um, in this way. Um, it's exciting to be able to have, again, some live worship. Thank you again to the band and to the AV team. Um, and anyone who's interested in being on an AV team should ask. There's plenty of space, um, lots and lots of space. So yeah, come and get involved and be involved in worship and help us to uh, keep going, particularly with the live worship, which we are enjoying greatly from last week. Um, Paul, when he writes to the Romans, says this, he says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's why we come to worship. We come to worship because nothing can prevent God from loving us. Nothing that we do, nothing that can happen to us, not even death can separate us from the love of God. So let's worship him now and we'll sing together and we'll stand to sing, Praise is Rising. our worship as we pray together. Lord Jesus, we do welcome you here. Come and inhabit our praises as they rise to you. Fill this place with your spirit. Let us be overawed by your very presence. Stir up that hope within us again. Rekindle that yearning in our hearts for the only one who can fulfill it. Come, Lord Jesus. We know, Lord, that 
When we see you, we do find strength to face each day, but too often we have not even looked for you. That we have not sought your presence. That we have turned our back on you this week. That we have not only ignored you, but we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed. Have mercy on us, loving Father. Do not turn away from us. Do not be deaf to our prayers. Hear us as our hearts return to you. Mend our brokenness. Restore us to your kingdom. Save us, O God, for there is no other who can. Wash away our fears this morning as we come into your presence. Lift our hearts, our minds, and everything as we bring you our hosannas. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. And hear us, Lord, as we put aside all that is past and put aside our differences and join together in one voice in the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So, um, uh, We're upstairs getting to study the book of Titus, um, but the kids downstairs are also getting to learn some interesting things. Um, And today they're doing a story and um, it's all about actually what's important in life. And I thought to myself, people up here need to know what's important in life as well. So I thought it would be a good idea if uh, if we heard this story, it's a story that Jesus told, uh, well sorry, it's a person that Jesus met rather, it's not a story he told, it's a person he met. Um, and rather than me tell you the story, um, I found this video which I think does a better job than I would explaining a little bit about um, a man that we only really know by his title, which was he was a rich young ruler. So there we go. Now you're all feeling hungry. Um, but the point of that story is that actually it's not about not about the fact that he was a rich young ruler, it was about the fact that he, he was hung up on the money um, and um, he didn't realize just how much that he would uh, get if he turned and followed Jesus. Um, so it wasn't necessarily about whether or not we have money that we need to give up, we shouldn't think about the money, it's about what's the most important thing in our lives. And for some of us that, that isn't money because we don't have much, for some of us it might be guacamole I guess. Um, not for, I don't like guacamole, so that's not me. Um, but there, I'm sure there are other things in my life that are actually probably more important than they should be. Um, so let's just pray quickly. Lord Jesus, thank you for the lesson that you uh, gave to that rich young ruler. Uh, help us to understand how important you are, uh, but also help us to be honest with ourselves about uh, the things that are important in our lives and, and where they have become too important where they become more important than you, help us um, to, uh, to give those things up and to give them back to you uh, so that we can follow you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a song. Um, I don't, I'm trying to remember if, if I've done this one before. Um, this is another one of the Sovereign Grace songs. It's called Nothing Better Than Jesus. Um, and uh, it, it's relatively simple, but we'll, we'll try and sing along as best we can. Um, and it's going to um, be a video. And then after that, obviously, the, uh, the children and young people can head out through the back door um, for Sunday school. But let's sing Nothing Better Than Jesus.
Let's continue in our prayers um, today. Uh, our prayers are, are based around the idea of both too much and too little. Let's pray. Lord God, we come as those who pray too little, who worry too much, who trust you too little and try to control too much. Lord, we pray for those who try and exert too much control. We pray for those who rule in totalitarian states who rule with rods of iron, military power. We pray for those who live in those countries, particularly those who are persecuted for their faith. We pray, Lord, that you, as King of Kings, would re-exert your control in those places. that those suffering would suffer no more and would find freedom. Lord, we pray for those countries where there is too little control, where there is war between different factions wanting power, where there is suffering and famine and drought and an imbalance that means many suffer. We pray, Lord, for all those who work in those countries, for the aid agencies who are seeking to bring relief, and for those working in diplomacy, seeking to find control again in those places, seeking to find a balance of power that is healthy. Lord, we pray for those who have too much money, for those who in their greed refuse to share, for those who oppose fairer tax reforms, those who hide their money from the tax man, those who are constantly seeking the next thing to buy. We pray, Lord, that they would seek fulfillment in other areas. So they would not be like the rich young ruler who turned away sad, but instead would be like Zacchaeus, who returned all he had stolen and gave back more than he had taken and gave much to the poor because of his delight in you. And we pray for those, Lord, who have too little money, who are struggling with debt, or simply struggling under poor wages. We pray for those in our country who are fearing the reduction in universal credit, who are facing rising utility bills, fears over winter heating, fears over whether or not they can make a hot meal for their children. We pray, Lord, that you would come and provide. That you would give them all that they need for themselves and their families. That your, your church would rise up and help. Would stand for those who seemingly have no voice in the corridors of power. Lord, we pray for those who have too much work. We think of those in hospitals who are struggling with demands of uh, the increase patients for, through COVID, struggling to find beds, struggling to find appointments for other problems, working longer and longer hours in harder and harder conditions feeling undervalued by the authorities. We pray particularly for those in hospitals, for nurses and doctors. Lord, give them strength and hope. 
We pray for those in education struggling to add online teaching to in-person teaching as the universities go back and the difficulties of uh, students being away through COVID and indeed teachers and lecturers having to take time off to isolate and the workload gets passed on. We pray, Lord, that you would bring an ease to the pressure, wisdom to those in authority. Lord, we pray for those who have too little work, for those who are long-term unemployed, and particularly those who were made redundant during lockdown as businesses failed. Lord, we pray for those whom life has become too much and are overwhelmed with all that is happening, overwhelmed with the shifting regulations, overwhelmed with not having had a proper holiday or a break, overwhelmed with the stresses and strains of working from home or having to go back into an office they don't feel as safe. Pray, Lord, that they would know the peace that passes all understanding. And pray for those for whom life is too little. Those with few personal contacts, those who are lonely. I think particularly of those in nursing homes whose family cannot visit because of COVID whose little interaction with human, with other humans is actually limited even further in this time, we pray that you would comfort them. Be a friend and a family to them in this time. We pray for those for whom the things they consume have become too much and are overwhelmed by addiction. Lord, that you would break the chains of addiction that they would find a new life beyond that which has bound them. We pray for those for whom their, their life has become too little and are struggling with their mental health, those who are depressed or bipolar, those with eating disorders, suicidal thoughts. We pray, Lord, that they would find the help and the care that they need from their friends and their family, from professionals, and from you. O oh God, who is more than enough, but never too much, let us be satisfied in you. Let us give all that we have to you, for that is not too much. Indeed, it seems like too little. Help us to be your hands and your words to those in need. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing again, Purify My Heart.
Thanks, guys. That's great. So um, we come today still in Titus chapter 1. For those of you who have been along in the evenings racing through Hebrews, this will feel like a snail's pace, um, but it is only a short book. Um, for the last two weeks, obviously, we've been reading the initial part of chapter 1 um, and looking at what was happening in the church in Crete. And then last week, we looked at this call to the church to appoint people of integrity, people of good character who would be able to lead this church which had been uh, disrupted by false teachers who were teaching what was not true and who were doing so for their own gain. Um, and so uh, Paul has said to Titus, you need to go, you need to appoint elders in all the towns for each of these kind of small house churches likely, um, and they need to be people of integrity whose lives match what they say. So they don't just talk the talk, but they walk the walk. They do what they are calling others to do, and they're not doing it for any kind of gain themselves. So that's where we got to last week. And so let's read the end of chapter 1 of Titus. We're beginning to read at verse 10, um, Titus chapter 1. For there are many rebellious people, full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced, because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true, therefore rebuke them sharply, so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Amen. So now we get to, in some ways, the, the meat of what Paul is objecting to in this church in Crete, um, and why he wants to set up uh, these uh, elders, these overseers, these leaders within the church, and why he's asked Titus to go and do this, um, because of what's happening and what's being taught. He says, we didn't read verse 9, we read verse 9 last week, he says, you know, we'd set them up so that they can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Because what was happening was all this bad teaching that was going on, and they were disrupting whole households, Paul says. Now, this may be families, or it may actually refer to individual house churches. Um, we're not sure here, but he's talking about households, but he's saying that actually these people have been a disruptive influence on the church. They are teaching something, which doesn't, hasn't got there yet, but he's saying they, they are coming in and they are teaching, and they need to be uh, refuted. They're full of meaningless talk and deception. They are rebellious. They are rebelling against the gospel, the good news. And he says, particularly look out for those who are of the circumcision group. Now, what he's referring to here, uh, we think, is that um, there were people who were saying, look, in order to be a good Christian, what you need to be is first a good Jew, and therefore you need to be circumcised, and you need to follow all of the, uh, the Jewish customs, the eating rituals, and, and all of these things. In order to be a Christian, you have to do all of these things. And, and throughout the New Testament, what you will see um, is the church actually pushing against that and saying, actually, no, that is not the case. If you're if you not Jewish, if you are a Gentile, and you become a Christian, you don't suddenly need to become Jewish. Actually, that's not what needs to happen. And so he's saying, you know, be careful of these people. This is what they're teaching, and it's disruptive, it's meaningless, it's deceiving them, and they're doing it for dishonest gain. That's what it says um, at the end of verse 11. 
So this is not just a doctrinal battle. This is not just a question of um, people having a bit of a, a fight over theology. He's actually saying they're profiting in some way from their deception. They're doing it because they get something from it. Now, interestingly, for those of you who are into your etymology, uh, if you've ever heard the phrase filthy lucre, that's how Tyndale uh, translated this, one of the earliest translations of the Bible, when it says dishonest gain in the NIV. He says, and that for the sake of filthy lucre. Although it's not necessarily, we don't know for sure this is just about financial gain. It might just be about power and control but there's something quite visceral about the idea of they're doing it for filthy lucre. There's something quite dirty about what's going on here. People who are trying to convince the church to do religious things, holy things, so that they might prosper, benefit, And then he goes and he quotes from what he calls one of the Cretan prophets, uh, Epimenides. If you've got footnotes in your Bible, it probably tells you that. Um, I think he lived around about uh, 6 BC. Um, And and he quotes uh, this prophet saying, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Now, it's interesting here that what he could have done is he could have gone and he could have said, actually, let me tell you about what it's like to be a Christian. Let me tell you about the spirit or let me tell you about something from the Old Testament about what people are to be like. But instead, he chooses something from their own culture. And he says, look, even, even the Cretans know what Cretans are like. Even the Cretans know that the Cretan nature is somehow fallen, is somehow Uh, deceptive is somehow lazy and gluttonous in it for their own gain and he's drawing obviously a parallel here between what Epimenides was saying and those who are teaching in the church he's saying look they are lying to you they are evil and they're doing it because they are lazy gluttons for their own gain And he says, look, that's, that's what this guy said. That's what someone from this culture has identified. And he says, do you know what? And it's true. This saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith. And again, that's an interesting thing. He doesn't say, kick them out. He doesn't say, have nothing to do with them. He says, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith. So there's an element here of, despite all that he said um, beforehand, there's an element actually of immaturity. that They've come in and they've gained a position of power, but they could still be found to be sound in the faith. And he wants to return, I think, the individuals, but also the churches into, onto that path of sound faith. Um, and then he goes on in 14, he says, pay no attention to the Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. And what he's saying here is he's saying, actually, is the, again, a common thing if you read through the New Testament. Um, he says, you know, don't place yourself under Jewish law. Again, as we talked about circumcision group, they're saying you need to place yourself under Jewish law, and he's saying you don't need to do that. This is a common thread throughout the New Testament. And then again, going on in in verse 15, this kind of almost a strange saying, says, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. And, And this is really referring to the Jewish purity laws and this idea that in in Jewish culture that actually what you ate affected your purity. Um, But as we know from what Jesus said, he said, Jesus said, actually, it's not what what you put in your stomach that makes you impure or pure. Um, It is actually what comes out of your heart. And 
This we see again, it's a common thread, this idea of actually, do you know what? Eating food is not going to make you impure. It's what, what your heart is doing. If your heart is corrupt, then nothing that you do will make that pure. The law, the dietary laws, the purity laws of the Jewish culture are not going to make you pure. They are merely going to highlight your impurity. Whereas through Jesus, through the transformed heart, once Jesus has changed your life, once you've moved from darkness into light, once you've moved from death into life, then actually what you eat isn't going to make any difference to that. So he's setting up almost these two sides here. We've got, on the one hand, we've got this side, the kind of Cretan cultural life, which seems to push people towards being liars, brutes, and um, lazy gluttons. But this kind of cultural background. He's also now looking at the Jewish background um, and the Jewish law, and often this insistence that Christians should um, uh, should submit themselves to Jewish law. And he's saying. You know, do neither of these things. Do neither of these things. Be people of integrity. Integrity comes from the, firstly from a heart that is transformed through Jesus and through what Jesus has done that then transforms our actions and we become people who do what we say because it comes from the heart. So we see in verse 16, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Which is fairly damning. But he's saying, look, these teachers don't have integrity. Their actions do not match their words. And so they claim to be people who are good, holy, righteous followers of God, but actually when you look at what they do, they are denying God by what they do. So set up these elders. Set up people in the church who are of integrity so to counteract what's happening with these other teachers. And and Beware and be careful, because what's happened here is you've got uh, people being influenced by the Jewish religious culture, but also, it seems, by the Cretan secular culture, or at least non-Jewish culture. And, And we sit in a very similar position often in our lives. We're very susceptible to the culture that is around us. It's not a Cretan culture. Um... But we do live in a culture where there are many who are outside the church who, would, who, who are intent on telling the church exactly what it should be. And they'll happily even quote scripture, particularly the words of Jesus, and they will tell Christians, well, Jesus said this, therefore you must do this for their gain, to promote their ideas. And so we too can struggle under the influence of culture but also not just culture, just not like the, uh, this church here, not just the Cretans, but, the, but the, the, the circumcision group, the Jewish people influencing them from a more religious point of view. And, and we are easily susceptible to being influenced by religious voices. Probably now more so than any other time in history, because we live in the age of the internet, where there are hundreds of thousands if not millions of voices that can compete for our attention, and many of them come with a religious feel. You could go home today, once I'm done, well, you could go home early if you want, but please stay, Uh, but you could go home today and between midday and midnight, you could listen to another 20 sermons from another 20 preachers, easily, and you could do that every day of this week. And many of them will be fantastic and good. 
but some of them could well be misleading and unhelpful. There are so many voices that we as individuals can hear, so many opportunities uh, for us to be disrupted by outside voices. And some of those are, yes, the voices of our culture saying, well, our culture is like this, and therefore, if you're going to be a Christian in our culture, you need to behave in this way. But there's also the voices that come from those who would be religious, who would be holy and present themselves as truthful, but are not. So how do we deal with the voices competing for our, intention, uh, our attention? Well, I'm going to use something that, well, I suspect this is probably slightly more common uh, when I first did it about 20 years ago. Um, but um, I'm going to tell you how to sort it out with the help of Bart Simpson. Um, who, as you know, is a holy character. No, he's not a holy character. Um, he has uh, some interesting things to say to us. This has nothing to do with Bart Simpson, um, but I'm going to use the acronym BART um, as a way of helping us to think about how we interpret the voices that speak to us, how we interpret what we read, how we interpret what we listen to um, online, and all these things. And so all you need to do is remember BART, which will hopefully be simple enough. Um, so the first and most important question, and these are actually ranked in order of importance. The first question is, is it biblical? If someone tells you something about how you should behave and it's not biblical, um, then don't do it. You can just ignore those ones. It's nice and simple. Um, if someone says, do you know what? Actually, it would be really good if you could just steal that thing for me. Then you could say to yourself, pretty sure Bible quite down on stealing. Um, probably not a good thing to do. You can ignore that. You can ignore the other ART. If it's not biblical, then uh, just leave it alone. And, and actually, when it comes to hearing perhaps the religious voices rather than the cultural voices, we talked last week about how it's important to interpret scripture with scripture. Um, and so actually, if someone gives you an interpretation of what a piece of scripture might mean, then equally, you can, um, you can say, actually, I'm not sure about that, because actually scripture tells me that that's not true. So for instance, you could have looked at last week's passage and said, actually, um, you know, really, it's important that those who teach in church um, don't have any gain from it, so we shouldn't pay them, um, which would make me very sad. Um, and quite poor. Um, but actually, seriously, you, you could look at la last week's passage and say, do you know what, actually dishonest gain is a bad thing, and therefore those who teach should not be paid. But you could then, if, if you knew the passages, you could say, actually, well, if we look at Scripture, if we look through the New Testament at what Paul says um, in, uh, in Corinthians um, and, and the way that he acts, that actually you should give a worker the wages that he deserves. And so it's not actually a good interpretation of what that's trying to say. So we use scripture to interpret scripture. If something's not biblical, then you can leave it alone. The second thing is A. A is for agreement. Uh, scripture tells us that we have the mind of Christ, that actually we don't live in isolation, we don't live individually, um, we live as part of the body of Christ, and that all the parts of the body need to work together um, we all know what it feels like when a bit of our body is not working properly. And depending on which part of our body it is, will depend on how uh, painful it is or how disruptive it is, but actually we notice it. Whether it's a paper cut on a finger um, or something more serious, you know, we all work together in this. And, and when it comes to understanding um, uh, what culture is saying and what other voices are saying to us, it's good to actually get the agreement of others. Now that might include uh, your elder, um, other folks in church, and say, look, I was reading this or I was hearing this um, and I'm not sure, what do you think about this? Or it might be um, kind of other Christians that we trust. Um, it might even be that actually we look at uh, what other Christians have said through history, um, as we read through um, maybe other, uh, other books and other writings, and we say, actually, is this what people have said? 
Is this what people agree with? Is there a sense that actually what I'm being taught here and what I'm being given has an agreement? Or is it just some strange offshoot? Because actually, we are the body of Christ, and together we can work these things out. And we can look at the Christians around us and the Christians throughout history and say, is there an agreement here? And there are some things where you will find two sides, and there are some things that are more difficult than others. Um, but if you find something and you think to yourself, ah, you know what, no one has ever read it that way, then you might want to say to yourself, maybe there's a reason that no one's ever read it that way. So is there an agreement of others? Thirdly, is it, is it relevant? Because actually I believe very much God wants to speak to us in our situation. And again, this is third on the list for a reason. It's not always the main thing, but actually I do think that God likes to speak to us through scripture, through what we listen to and what we read um, of him. But he wants to speak to, to me in my situation. He wants to call on me. He has a purpose for me. Um, and, and, and if someone suddenly says, well, actually, that, here is this thing you, um, that, that is really important for you, and you think to yourself, but that doesn't match my situation at all. That doesn't match what I know about myself. Well, then maybe you should think again and say, well, actually, maybe that's not something that's relevant for me. That's not something that God is saying to me. And lastly, and least importantly, in a lot of ways, T, does it, te, I've put testifies, does, is there something within me? Because we all have the Spirit of God within us. That's what Scripture tells us when we come to know Jesus, when we accept Jesus. He pours His Spirit out upon us. Um, and, and so God lives within us through His Spirit. And, and sometimes there is just that sense when you're sitting and you, you may be listening to someone preach or you're reading a book and there's something within you that goes, oh yes, I, I know because I know because I know that that is something that is just hitting the mark for me, that God has spoken to me through that book or through that sermon or through that speaker. Now, this is bottom of the chart for a reason. Don't start with this one, because sometimes we're, we're, we're very easily self-deceived. It's very easy to go, oh, that's definitely the right thing. Um, and then later on we find out it's not biblical. Don't go that direction. That's problematic. But actually, if you get down through the first three, and then you get to this last one, just pray. Say, you know, God, if you're not sure, say, God, actually, reveal this to me. Let me know. A spirit, something about it. Let it rise up in me so that I know that this is the right thing. So that's Bart. Is it biblical? Does it have the agreement of others? Is it relevant to me? Does it testify in my spirit or other in God's spirit within me? This is a way of helping us to discern the voices that would speak into our lives, whether they are cultural or, or religious. Um, I, I think it's just a helpful rubric um, and a helpful way of thinking about it. And I want to encourage all of us to be people who ask questions. It's very difficult at times. I, I think um, there's often an encouragement in churches to almost act as if we have the answers. But we don't. We just have more questions. So let's be people who ask questions. If you've got a question about anything I've said this morning, ask the question. Come and ask me. Ask someone else in church that you trust more than me. It doesn't, I, I don't mind. I won't be offended. If you're not sure, ask a question. Now, I'm, I promise you, I will make a promise, I'm not going to throw in any trick bits in any sermon at any point. I'm not throwing it in just to see if you're going to ask a question about it. Um, it, you know, sometimes I just make mistakes, that does happen, but I'm never going to try and deliberately say something that you should be questioning, but I would encourage you to question everything. To actually say, is this what God has been saying to us? Is this what this scripture says? So let's be people who ask questions, ask questions of each other. 
ask questions of me or of the elders. Because I think that that is such a core part of what we need to be, particularly in this culture. We cannot present as having all the answers unless we first deal with the questions and ask them honestly and openly and encourage people to be that kind of believer. Because if we are simply a church that provides answers, what happens is that people go out and the questions start coming and they don't just come from the religious sources, they come from the cultural sources and suddenly the answers don't feel as as powerful as they were when they were sitting in here. So instead of having the answers, let's have the questions. Because ultimately, I believe in those questions that God will lead people to Jesus, who is the answer. But we have to ask the questions. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we live in a society that asks many questions, where many people are seeking something, but they don't know what it is. We live in a society that desperately needs you, Lord Jesus. Help us to trust in the work of your spirit in people's lives. Help us to be honest with our own doubts and questions. Help us to be people who ask the questions of each other and so be encouraged in the faith and so be lifted up and so be strengthened in our beliefs. Help us to read your word so that we would be able to test against it, that we would know what is biblical because we have read your word. Help us to be in relationship with others that we would be able to find the agreement, not always seeking the answers that we want and only meeting with those who give us the answers we want, but actually finding others who maybe don't always agree with us. Help us to look for you to speak into our lives, to be relevant to us each day, to have you be more important that every day is a day when we interact with you. And Lord, fill us again with your spirit, that your spirit might testify within us to the truth. Must, might point us again to the good news that we can be free from the religious laws, but also free from the lies of culture. That we can be pure of heart, not through our actions, but through the act of Jesus on the cross and in his resurrection. Amen. I'm going to sing finally that uh, great hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, a song about being rescued, about being saved uh, from all that would bind us, and then obviously the more modern edition, My Chains Are Gone. So let's sing Amazing Grace.
May God, the source of all perseverance and all encouragement, grant that you may agree with one another after the manner of Christ Jesus, and so with one mind and one voice may praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>